This case is pretty old. It's really well known because of its implications with um, laws about missing children and the way that we advocate for missing children now. So a lot of you guys are going to know it. And the way I'm telling it is a little different because I'm kind of laying down the facts and then going back through some theories. But since it is well known and so old, there are very... Mm, it's so weird because there's not a ton on it other than just the factual information and then in order to get like a good basis of like the theories and everything you have to really like dig into reddit and stuff which of course i did because you know i love it so anyways of course we did yeah let's get into this this is the case of johnny gosh so john david or johnny gosh was born on november 12 1969 to john and noreen gosh living in west des moines iowa his parents lived there with also his two half siblings, which is from his mother's first marriage, and the family dog. And it might be a little too soon, but her name's Gretchen. Aww, Gretchen. Gretchen. And it was a mini uh, Dotson. 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 There we go. Thank you. Right. The spelling of it is just really not. I how- used to think it was Dashound. Dashound. Just Dashound. Um, okay. So every morning, Johnny would deliver newspapers on his route with the um, the D- Des Moines uh, Register. Sorry, I don't know why I couldn't get that out of my mouth. Which is what he did to earn extra cash. And his first big like purchase he made with all of his saved up money was actually for a dirt bike. Oh, yeah. So he was out there hustling and bustling for a reason. So Johnny's father, named John, would always join 12-year-old Johnny on his like morning route. But on the morning of Sunday, September 5th, 1982, Johnny just wanted to li- deliver his on his own. And uh, it, it was mainly because like his buddies were allowed to go on his, their own. So he's like, Dad, like, I, don't, I don't want Dad, you to come with me. Like, yeah. I want to go by myself. I just want to go by myself, like, please. Please. Okay, please. So he had asked his father the night before if he could go alone. And he also asked his mother at the same time. And they both were like, literally, no. But despite this, Johnny just didn't wake up his father, grabbed his dog Gretchen, and was like, you're going to be my chaperone today, picked up his red delivery wagon, and headed to the paper drop to pick up his newspapers for the day, and this was at around 5.45 a.m. So according to his mother, Noreen, in a CNN article, Johnny was great at his job literally he was presented with the perfect service award from the register and because the the reason he was given this is because he never was late on a single paper in the 13 months that he had had this rope wow wow like first off for a 12 year old props to you because 5 30 in the morning i'm delivering newspapers right it can come late especially on a sunday morning like Mm. you guys aren't even awake yet yeah it's sunday morning what what are we guys what are we doing guys so other than the fact that johnny just left without his dad that morning his parents were woken at around 7 a.m um and it was calls from people that saying like hey your son hasn't delivered our papers yet like what's going on so john his dad went to johnny's room like freaking out like oh my god we overslept we overslept and when he goes into his room he realizes that johnny gretchen and the red wagon were all gone so he had for sure started that route that morning So John just jumped in his car and began driving around where Johnny normally was, fearing that maybe he had gotten injured. And then he comes across Gretchen, like two houses down. She's just walking her way home. And then he keeps driving and he discovers his son's red wagon that was filled to the brim with newspapers that had yet to been delivered. Immediately, Noreen and John call the West Des... I keep telling to say Des Moines. Uh, West Des Moines? Des Moines. Des Moines <laughs> Police Department and report Johnny missing. So according to Noreen's book, Why Johnny Can't Come Home, she discusses how it took officers over 45 minutes to arrive at their home to take like this report. Well, <laughs> the police department was 10 blocks away. So it should and have it, taken five. It should have taken two. Like, yeah. what? But even still, officers would not investigate 12-year-old Johnny's mysterious disappearance as a missing persons case until 72 hours had passed. Are you serious? And even then, they pushed the family aside and was like, look, he's just a runaway. He'll be back. He'll turn back up. He's fine. No. No. So Noreen and John refuse to sit by and just wait for police to take them seriously. Regard- wait, pause. Regardless if he's a runaway, he's still 12 years old. He's 12 years old and his newspaper thing is missing. His dog's walking home. Some, I mean, right. his newspaper thing is 
completely filled sitting Like, if he there. was running away, he wouldn't take a whole ass wagon filled with newspapers. And drop it on the side of the road. Like, first off, I'm bringing my backpack. Like, right. no. So, they refuse to sit by and wait for police to take them seriously. And they start their own investigation and searches for Johnny. Starting going by, go, starting by going door to door, asking for any information, and calling everyone who had been at the newspaper drop that morning. They then discover that while um, Johnny was there, so he had gone and picked up the papers, which we already knew because his um, wagon was filled. He was seen by his friend, fellow paper boy Mike, and a local neighbor who was a retired lawyer named John Rossi. And he was last seen by, well, not last seen, but he was seen leaving the paper drop with his stuff. So his buddy Mike told John, Johnny's parents that, after Johnny picked up his papers and was walking away from the drop, he wasn't like even a block away when a stocky man in a blue two-toned car began talking to him and then drove off. So Johnny continued walking towards his like the start his route and um, John Rossi spotted another blue car pull up and like start talking to Johnny. Well, in this car, there were two men. The man that was in the passenger seat was wearing a baseball cap and had dark hair and a dark complexion. And the man had asked Johnny for directions. So when Rossi was like walking up because he was like, why is this car pulling over and talking to my newspaper boy? Um, Johnny was like, oh, hey, can you tell me? They're asking how to get to 86th Street. Can you help me out? Like explaining how to get there to them. And the car slams the door, but before driving off, turns on their interior light, turns it on and off three times, and then does a U-turn and speeds off blowing through a stop sign at the end of the neighborhood. So Rossi went to Johnny, like went straight up to him and like grabbed him and was like, what the hell was going on? And because he felt like something was off in his gut. I mean, obviously so much so that he had actually taken note that the car's license plate was from Warren County, Iowa. Um, but he could not remember the plate numbers. So Johnny told Rossi that the men were asking for directions and that they were weird and made him feel weird. And so Rossi later actually underwent hypnosis to try and recover the plate numbers, but he just wasn't able to get the whole thing. He could recall a few, but like what's a one, two and a five going to do, Right. you know, when it comes to getting a license plate. He stated in an interview with police that he, quote, keeps hoping he will wake up one day in the middle of the night and just see those numbers on the license plate as as distinctively as night and day, but that just hasn't happened yet. Once Rossi and Johnny parted ways, Johnny walked a block north, and this is where he started to deliver his papers, and he saw his buddy Mike again. So I guess Mike and Johnny like kind of worked within like a block of each other. So they would be able to like see each other at crossings and intersections, you know, as they walk down. So Mike saw Johnny, but also behind Johnny, he spotted that there was a man walking on foot. And then Johnny walked out of Mike's eyesight. Well, just north, a few houses down from where Johnny's red paper, like newspaper wagon was later found, the neighbor that lived like around that area said that they had heard a door slam and tires screech and saw, watched as a silver Ford Fairmont sped, sped away and like out of the neighborhood past their home. So allegedly other witnesses in the areas watched as in this same Ford Fairmont, a man grabbed Johnny and shoved him into the back seat where there was another man that held Johnny down and then they sped off, but there are differing accounts on this. Even still, about five witnesses came forward claiming that Johnny had been kidnapped, but law enforcement refused to act on, act on this. Why? I don't know. Hey, 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 listen, I know this one's an ad, but just please don't skip this. I, I want you guys to really hear us out on this one because I, we are obsessed with this product. It's good. It's like I'm talking so good. good. It's, it's great. It's so good. <laughs> it's great. But there is no one size fits all solution when it comes to hair care. And we know that all too well. A product that works wonders for curls might make straight hair limp and greasy, which I fall into way too often. <laughs> Exactly. And my hair, since a certain thing that has happened to both of us, yes. our hair has been falling out in clumps. clumps. Like thinning, clumping, balding. I keep having to use Drano in my drains because of how much hair is falling out yeah. of my head because of stress. But thanks to my personalized pros routine, I can honestly say I have never been more in love with my hair. And we're literally not lying, okay? Pros makes custom hair care that is effective because it is 
personal. Using natural ingredients with proven results, Pros customizes every product in your routine from shampoo to supplements. First, Pro starts by asking about you as a person. Love that. Love that. Very, very, very personable. Intimate, right yes. there. Um, with their in depth consultation, pros ask me really unexpected things like What's your zip code? Because it's breaking down what is in your water and how it's affecting your hair. What are your eating habits? How much you work out? Like literally saying, hold up a piece of your hair and tell me if you can see any split ends. And they're everywhere. <laughs> Mine was actually kind of good. I was proud of that. But very detailed questions that are personal to you that help them build your personalized shampoo conditioner everything and then pros analyzes all my answers and determine what unique blend of ingredients should be in every product of my custom routine together pros got all of my hair goals covered we both got tons of things in our custom hair care routine i got like a pre-shampoo mask which i am freaking obsessed with it's for like root refresh for colored hair and it smells amazing mine also smells amazing it smells like eucalyptus Mm. um we got supplements Oh, yes, we got Um, shampoo, leave-in conditioner, pre-shampoo mask, regular conditioner. It is just amazing. We're like self-care to the max. A full hair routine is what they gave us. I've never had a full hair routine. Me neither. I didn't know you needed a hair routine. As carbon neutral certified B Corps, Pros is an industry leader in clean and responsible beauty. All of their ingredients are sustainably sourced, ethically gathered, and cruelty-free. They're also the first custom beauty brand to go carbon neutral. If you're not 100% positive Pros is the best hair care that you've had, they will take the products back, no questions asked. But you, pro- I promise you won't because it's amazing. Pros is the healthy hair regimen with your name all over it. Take your free in-depth hair consultation and get 15% off your first order today. Just go to pros.com slash creeps and crimes. That's P-R-O-S-E dot com slash creeps and crimes for your free in-depth hair consultation and 15% off. That's pros, P-R-O-S-E. A sponsor of Creeps and Crimes podcast. Noreen was not backing down. She hired a PI, was contacting the FBI, local and national um, media, forcing people to see Johnny's face and hear his story. Johnny's disappearance was making headlines by the morning after his disappearance. Noreen and John were giving interviews to anyone and everyone who would take on Johnny's story. They were organizing search parties and like, printing off over 10,000 flyers of with Johnny's face and like information on it that they spread all around their town and surrounding areas. So during one of these searches that was organized by his mom, um, the w, it's WDMPD police chief, um, wow. Orville Cooney, was on a microphone screaming he just went ran away everybody just go home you're being ridiculous Are just you go fucking home fucking kidding me i'm not kidding the, he and he said quote the damn boy ran away and he was drunk the oh police God, chief fired. is sitting there fired drunk. and then fucking jail like what so Tipton leads are pouring in to the family and their PI and even going to police, even though police aren't doing absolute like dog shit. And the main tip was being that Johnny had been abducted by a pedophile prostitution ring, one that was bigger than anyone could have ever imagined. I'm talking nationwide, worldwide, involving big names, politicians, celebrities, the CIA. But no one would listen to Johnny's parents and were calling them crazy and just saying like, you're reaching, you're reaching. But now looking back with everything we know about Pat Sullivan and Jeffrey Epstein, like, right. Were mm, they? What, no were one you was that reaching. crazy? No way. So more information was given to the PIs about this ring and people were claiming that Johnny was alive. He was being brainwashed and tortured, but being kept alive because one day he would serve as a member in this group and do the same to others that had been done to him. Six months after Johnny's disappearance in March of 83, a tip came in from a woman in Oklahoma. She was in Tulsa. The woman said that she was in a convenience store shopping when a boy who looked just like Johnny ran up to her and asked, um, asking for help. And she, he just kept saying, I am John David. Gosh, I am Johnny. Gosh, I've been kidnapped. I need help. And then as he's doing this, two men ran up to him, grabbed him and took him out of the store. Holy shit. Yeah. 
I would have probably been fist fighting. I know. I would have caused a scene. I would have. I have. I would have literally lost my mind if a kid ran up to me and was. I'd be like, I don't. I don't give a shit who you are. Like, even if you don't know who it is, like, yeah. Well, we're gonna figure this out. Right. So in 1984, Johnny's photo was featured on milk cartons across America. His photo appeared alongside Juanita. Uh, Lee Estavez or Estevez um, and Juanita and Johnny were the second and third abducted children to have their photos on these cartons the first was e- Eaton Paz who um, whose case established basically the beginning of the missing children's movement when he was abducted in 1979 so on August 12th 1984 13 year old Eugene Martin a fellow um, Des Moines Des Moines uh, area paper boy went missing when he was delivering papers on his regular route is it route or route I say route I keep going back and forth um, in South Des Moines and there was no connection ever established between Eugene and Johnny's cases however Noreen had been telling police that she had been tipped off about this abduction months before what it was a pi that had been working on johnny's case saying that someone had called in telling them that there was going to be a kidnapping taking place um in the second week of august on the south side and it did oh my god so that morning eugene had picked up his papers at 5 30 a.m before going missing leaving behind a bag full of undelivered newspapers and last being seen talking to a strange man in a car the fbi and police immediately jumped on this disappearance yet to this day eugene martin has never been found during the summer months of 1985 a woman working in a grocery store in oh my god what is this iowa i i cannot cover any more cases in iowa this is my official resignation from iowa cases iowa. the cities are just crazy it's it's uh what was it Sioux City. Sioux City. Dear God. Why do we need an I, an O, a U, and an X? I get that it's right, French. Just make it S U. Like <laughs> Sioux City. Sioux City, okay? Okay, so th- there was this woman. She was working in a grocery store and she had been given a dollar bill, but she noticed something on it and it was a message. The dollar bill read, I am alive, signed Johnny Gosh. Noreen and John traded the woman a dollar for the bill and after looking at it, they were positive that this was their son's handwriting later being confirmed by professional handwriting analysis wow yeah wild right and where was that oh sioux city don't even ask me okay are you kidding me was that a joke you bitch (laughs) okay so upon this discovery a news conference was held where johnny's parents offered to negotiate for their son's safe return they were willing to call off all investigations and not go forward with any legal actions according to the upi article written in july of 1985 the couple said quote Please, we beg of you, contact us privately and allow us to have our son back. Our son has endured enough pain and suffering. Please return him to us alive and unharmed. If his life has been taken, all that we ask is we may have information so that we at least know what happened to him. In 1985, Noreen received a letter, and the letter stated that the writer, a man named Samuel Forbes Dakota, was a guard at a motorcycle club nearby, and this motorcycle club was known for being a part of a large Czech child slavery, I don't know where that checks came from, child slavery ring, and Samuel, the writer, had saw Jenny there after his abduction. Johnny had been sold to a high-level drug dealer in Mexico City, who Samuel Forbes Dakota had very close relationships with. So Samuel requested $100,000 for their son's safe return. The Goshes offered him to wire him $11,000 up front, and after the safe return of their son, they would give them the, him the rest in cash. The man agreed, so they wired the money, but there was nothing more. After this, the, um, the FBI was able to track down this money and they tracked it to a 19 year old man named Robert Herman Meyer and the second and um, he was from Saginaw, Saginaw, Michigan. Sure. Meyer was arrested in Buffalo at the Canadian border by FBI agents and charged with fraud by wire. 
The parents of Johnny, the Goshes, they were fucking infuriated with the FBI and law enforcement for choosing just now to get involved and ruining all of their credibility and chances for anybody else that would offer ransom for their son. They believe that this man was telling the truth based off of the hints and tips that they had been given before this, or at least that he knew something. They wanted to keep him on their good side and keep that bridge of communication open no matter how much how how much it costed them but the fbi would not allow it harming all of their chances at ever seeing johnny again in their eyes on march 29th in 1982 i mean 1986 13 year old mark allen was walking to one of his friend's house when he went missing just a few blocks down from where johnny did but this time it was in the evening not in the morning He wasn't a paper boy, and this was not like a part of his routine. Either way, unlike Eugene's case, the police were back on their bullshit. And this time they were like, we have to do the 48 hour rule. He just probably ran away. (sighs) I'm sorry, the 48 hour rule should only be for missing adults. Even I don't even think it should be a rule at all. I don't think it should be a rule. At least 24 hours. If if there's enough like evidence that they did not leave willingly, then there should not. But if it is a child, there is no rule. There is they're no missing, role. they're fucking missing. They're missing, which is what it is now, most, mostly, mm-hmm. mostly. But Noreen, again, would not back down. In 1982, when he had first gone missing, she established the Johnny Gosh Foundation, where she would visit schools and speak at seminars nationwide about sexual predators and their MOs, lobbying for the Johnny Gosh bill that would require immediate police um, response to reports of missing children, making this bill a law in Iowa by by 1984. Good. In August of that same year, Noreen testified in Senate hearings on organizations Organized crime discussing organized pedophilia and how it played a role in Johnny's abduction. Also testifying b- before the U.S. Department of Justice, who later provided ten million dollars to establish the Nas- National Ch- Center um, for Missing and Exploited Children. Noreen was invited by the White House um, to the White House by President Ronald Reagan for the dedication ceremony. All the while receiving death threats for her constant pushing and advocating. She refused to back down, and this made her even more persistent, and it didn't go unnoticed. Well, one morning in March of 1997, 15 years after Johnny went missing, Noreen was asleep in her apartment when she was awoken by knocking at her door. It was around 2.30 a.m., but Noreen rushed up to the door, and when she looked through the people, she could see two young men standing there that looked to be in their 20s. Noreen asked them what they needed through the door, and one man responded saying, Mom, it's me, Johnny. Oh my God. Can we please come in? I have chills. She ripped the door open, open, recognizing her son, now much older voice and face, but she just said, let me see your birthmark. And he pulled up his shirt and showed him his birthmark on his chest. This was 27-year-old Johnny Gosh standing in front of his mother. Noreen hugged Johnny and let the two in. Johnny had to look for approval from the unidentified man that was there with him to speak, but they chatted for about an hour and a half, but they had to leave before sunrise. Johnny could not say where he was living or where he was going. He explained that he had been kidnapped by a massive sex trafficking ring and later escaped, having to stay on the run and under the radar to keep himself and others that had escaped safe. His hair was now long, shoulder length, dyed and straight, dyed black and straightened. He had to leave soon and get going, but wanted to hug her and thank her for never giving up on him. The FBI created a composite based off of Noreen's account, and um, she later talked about this a lot in her book, Why Can't Johnny Come Home, when she wrote it in 2000. In 1989, 21-year-old Paul A. Um, Benaki, do you think? Benaki. Benaki told John DeCamp, who was an attorney, that he had been abducted as a teenager and forced into a sex trafficking ring. And that's where he met Johnny Gosh. Paul went on to explain that he didn't just meet Johnny. He had actually played a role in his abduction. He said that Johnny had a birthmark on his chest, a scar on his tongue, and a burn scar on his lower leg. But the tongue and the burn on his leg had never been released to the public, only the chest birthmark. Oh my gosh. 
Right. Many others have come forward with similar claims. However, to this day, Johnny Gosh has never been officially found. There is a documentary called Who Took Johnny that you can watch on a few different platforms, but there are just so many theories as to what the hell happened to Johnny Gosh, so I'm going to take you through them. Number one is Sam Soda. So remember that tip that Noreen had gotten from one of her PIs about the abduction of Eugene Martin? Yes. <laughs> well, that tip came in from Sam Soda. So in June of 1984, Noreen was contacted by Sam Soda for a meeting. Soda claimed that he was a PI who wanted to work on Johnny's case pro bono. He went on to say that he had an informant that um, had told him that another boy would be abducted, which we now know was Eugene. So Noreen, being t- uh, really smart and experienced at this point by 84 with having these meetings, she tape recorded the entire thing. But re- police refused to believe her and help her stop this abduction. <sighs> she told everyone, though. She told media. She told everyone. And they all thought she was fucking crazy. Well, I'm glad she said it. Right. So after Eugene's abduction, an anonymous person began sending photos of composite, ske- of composite sketch made based off of the account of Rossi in the beginning of the man that had been in the car talking to Johnny f- and asking for directions. And along with this uh, sketch was sent a photo of Sam Soda. And it's a fucking match, dude. Oh, my God. Soda was legit a serial and compulsive liar, literally saying that he had the Purple Heart Award at one point. Oh, my gosh. And here's the photo. That's Sam Soda. This is the sketch. Uh, This is the sketch with his glasses on. uh Uh-uh. How whack. Uh uh-uh. yeah dude so what do you think he like infiltrated himself like into it that way he could stay ahead of the game that's literally what i have next not to mention the fact that he's the only person that implemented himself in this case sam also played a vital role in outing a local pedophile and guess where the dude worked the newspaper that johnny had his route for oh so it was his partner Mm mm-hmm so let's talk about this guy his name's frank Sycora, okay? 37-year-old Sycora worked for the circulation department at the Des Moines, uh, Des Moines Register and later attempted or admitted to molesting more than 14 paper boys That's that worked disgusting. there. He was later arrested and charged with third-degree sexual abuse and one count of lewd acts with a child, claiming that he had nothing to do with Johnny or Eugene's abduction slash disappearances. Yet, he was one of the only single people in the world that knew every single route and who was running those routes. However, he just did not match the composite sketch, but someone else did. So, let's talk about theory number three, the police officer. Mm. So, according to Noreen's book and an article written in November of 1982, Johnny Gosh and his mother, and well, his entire family, had been at Valley Stadium in West Des Moines, uh, Des Moines, two days before his abduction on September 3rd, 1982. So, the Gosh family had gone there to watch Johnny's older brother play a game of football at, and it's a local high school stadium. Um, Johnny was, like, going to get food his dad had given him some money to go get concessions so he went and got the concessions and when he was walking back like he was stopped and john just like couldn't see where he was so he got up to go look for him because he'd been gone for a while and he finds him underneath the bleachers talking to a police officer and so the two got to talking i guess the whole time no one knows what they talked about but they got to talking until john came up and was like uh come on what are you doing But on the way home and every day that followed, Johnny continued to talk about how he was going to be a police officer. And that's what he was going to do when he grew up. And then out of nowhere, which he had never done before, he wanted to do his newspaper route by himself. Mm. So despite the fact that he had been doing this with his father every morning for 13 months, like why wouldn't you want the extra help? Right. Exactly. Exactly. Noreen told police about this once Rossi had given the description of the man that was seen talking to Johnny just moments before his abduction and flashing the light three times because he looked eerily similar to the man that John Sr. saw talking to Johnny underneath the bleachers. So the WDMPD um, had 10 officers on duty working that game and they gave the Goshes photos of every single one of them. 
yet there was not a single match. So some believe that the the someone had been stalking Johnny, pretending to be a police officer, and others believe that the police department covered this up because yep. the officer was real and they couldn't they gave just like another officer that really wasn't there that night. Holy shit. So if that was the case, they knew what this person had done and they were hiding it. And allegedly this was hinted at by the former West Des Moines mayor george mills because according to him chief of police orville orville cooney the literal cooney who was drunk drunk screaming there he was best friends with the omaha police chief robert wadman wademan and cooney would attend these parties with this guy and um also involved in these parties was sam soda so that's like another connection. I know you don't know who this Omaha guy is, but it's about to make sense. But these are not just any parties. They were child trafficking parties. Oh my God. Put on by Nebraska's very own Franklin Network, which leads me to theory number four, the Franklin Network, a child prostitution ring. On September 25th, 1982, just weeks after Johnny disappeared, a story was published about two um, Des Moines girls who had been kidnapped and forced into a prostitution ring in Omaha, Nebraska. Noreen took this to the chief of police, Orville Cooney, but he refused to investigate any possible links between the two, just like Eugene's case and Mark's case with Johnny's. After this, Noreen received threats from people telling her to, quote, stop making waves. Mm, in 1988 right in 1988 authorities began looking into allegations that prominent people in nebraska including high-level u.s politicians were involved in trafficking children the victims claimed that they were children in foster care systems and they were flown to the east coast to be sexually abused with the main allegations being centered around a man named lawrence e king jr who ran franklin community federal credit union in omaha nebraska the ring was said to be a cult of devil worshippers that, in, that were involved in mutilation, cannibalism, and the sacrificing of numerous children. Oh my God. People believe that this goes as far as the CIA with their arms dealing and drug tra- trafficking. This has this was the exact same ring, the uh, Nebraska Network or Franklin Network, that Paul Bonacki, whatever we called him, um, was allegedly abducted by. So this is like a like a literally all it connects a all full over. fucking circle. So Paul told anyone who would listen that there was this man named Emilio and he was the one who was buying and trading children. He drove a Ford Fairmont and the day of Johnny's abduction, he told Paul it was his job to hold Johnny down once he was shoved into the car. Paul said that Emilio had local Des Moines contacts who would scout boys for him, specifically one. And Paul knew his uh, face, but like not his name. So the man had come to the hotel the night before to meet Paul and Emilio. And he had given them a photo of Johnny and explained like all of his information where he would be. So a photo lineup was given of 15 men to Paul and Paul was to pick out a single person. And he did. In full confidence, literally screaming, that's him, that's him right there, that's the guy. And it was fucking Sam Soda. Oh, shit. So throughout this entire story, Paul continually spoke about another man that they called the Colonel. And this man's real name was Michael Aquino. Aquino? Yeah. And Michael was in the U.S. Army, um, specializing in psychological warfare, serving as lieutenant colonel in the military in military intelligence. And this dude, I shit you guys not, looks just like fucking Dracula. Like, I'm not even joking. I, I have to show you a picture before we move on, Morgan. Hold on. That motherfucker is Dracula. <laughs> is Dracula. Period. That is literally. Holy shit. That is Dracula. It was a jump scare, actually. <laughs> she pulled that shit on the screen and I jumped back. It's, it's also the I eyeliner jump. for me. It's the widow's peak that I have. It's the half eyebrow. It was, I mean, it's intense. He looks like Dracula. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> but it is very, his looks are very on brand um, because he is a Satanist. He oh. is an ordained Satanic priest and the founder and leader of the uh, Temple of Set. Both him and his wife are both uh, cult leaders and used to follow Anton Levy, who was the founder of the Church of Satan. Holy shit. So very on brand. Like it makes yeah, sense. Yeah, 
So the Franklin Network is thought to be a giant hoax, actually, and has been, quote, proven to be a hoax. But of course, it had to be because look who was involved. Despite the fact that the ring itself has been incredibly well documented. Like I, you could do an entire thing on first off the temple of Satan or whatever this dude is. There for it. Yeah, I think you definitely should because, oh my God, he, I mean, there's got to be some crazy shit out there on this guy. Yeah. Um, anyways, Johnny's parents were so convinced that Johnny had been sold into a sex slavery ring that the PI working on their case, um, Dennis Wheland, attended a child auction in <gasps> Houston, Texas that was connected to the Franklin Network. It's Even though hoax. they say it's a hoax. A hoax. Um, anyways, Johnny was not there among the children that were sold that day. And allegedly, this ring, ha- ring has ties to Epstein and Pat Sullivan. Of course they do. So, that is so fucked up. Like, what do they... What is it that, like, <laughs> we... I mean, there's no justification for it, but like, what is it to these higher powers that like, why do they want they, kids? Why do they? Yeah. Why do they want kids? Why do you want kids? It makes no sense. It makes literally like, what you have a little bit of money. So all of a sudden you're a pedophile. Like, like that's why it's almost, it's almost like hard for me to even like fully believe in these sex trafficking rings because it's literally like, why, why? do you want kids? Like why? Yeah. Why do you want kids? It makes no sense. But okay. So there's something I didn't mention in this, in my notes and stuff, just because the way that I was, you know, getting all of the theories and stuff was mainly through Reddit and, you know, blog posts and things. Mm hmm. But there's a lot of speculation that his parents were involved. Really? Yeah. That makes me sad. Because apparently, like, in the weeks leading up, the mom, the parents are, I think, separated now. And, well, I don't know what they're doing now. But anyways, they were separated. And it was because um, in the weeks before Johnny's abduction, his dad was receiving calls in the middle of the night that he would, like, take secretly and then they stopped after the abduction. But then I'm thinking, like, you probably were just cheating. Right. And then after your son got abducted, I just feel you like if, if you were involved, I mean, I mean, maybe the father was, but, like, for Noreen specifically, yeah. like, she pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. And if she was so involved, like, I could see her pushing for the first year and then being like, okay, I didn't get caught. Like, yeah, let good. me chill. We're good. But, like, for years, and I mean, you're talking decades yeah. that but you push. People also think that she might know and got, like, paid off, be, mainly because of that he came over to my house. But I think if that wasn't true, if that wasn't true, it might just be like a form of psychosis just after mm-hmm. all of this. I mean, could you imagine for 15 years just mm-hmm. not wanting to yeah. let go of your son being oh abducted? Well, I hope that's not the case. I I know. Because she seems like a good mama. But yeah. um, so I was thinking, though, when we were talking about, like, why do they want kids? And it has a lot to do with um, Satanism because mm-hmm. kids are pure. And that's... Yeah. In the blood, too. Yeah. In the adrenal glands. Yeah. It's so fucked up. But So fucked, man. Today's been crazy. Today's episode's been whack. I hope you guys are okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Damn. What happened to us? We just... We went dark. We got so dark. Dark I, I was shit. like, oh, great. You're, you're doing that new case. Perfect. I, I was going to do... I was going to do... I was going to do something actually kind of good but not but a little better than this but it's still sad because i had to do with kids and i was like well you're doing a kid i can't do that but I was, then you picked a kid anyway. i was gonna cover <laughs> in a whole trap kid child traffic game right? well i mean i was like this will go flow perfect with it yeah because it's just so whack and yeah. one thing i didn't another thing i didn't know because there just wasn't a lot behind this apparently johnny was a member and his family were members of a catholic church and this was kind of at the peak about 10 years well a little over 10 years about 15 years before the catholic priest scandal started being investigated yeah and there were you still need to cover that priests in their area i I need to do it soon i kind of want to save it for like a bigger episode Mm -hmm. i was thinking maybe i do um casey anthony soon oh and the pop that in yeah like casey anthony and then the child priest scandal be fun yeah, we'll see. Let us know, guys. Let us know what you want. Sorry for being so dark. Um, join Patreon if you don't want to be dark. I'm up. We said something the other day. I don't know what recording it was on, but we were like, we're gonna, we're gonna put, we're gonna, we're gonna put, be really light here on out. Well, yeah, we said that, but um, we we told somebody that we told y'all that we were gonna put a a a poll on social media for something. 
do you know what the fuck that yeah, was? Yeah, it was for Patreon. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're not doing it because, yeah. Oh, okay. they'll, they'll get a poll on um, June 1st. Okay. You yeah, get you'll a get a poll on June 1st. You'll get a poll on June 1st. Everybody can play in the poll. Yeah, everybody can play. We love polls. They're fun. We okay. like stripping on them. We like doing them. <laughs> we like dancing on them. We like dancing on them. We like like <laughs> we love to dance we love polls <laughs> we love them love polls anyway we like hope- voting in them <laughs> okay we like voting in the polls um what else can you do in a poll hanging on polls yeah doing pull-ups on polls no i don't mm, sideways <laughs> I, I, I don't think i could do a pull-up right now even if i tried my hardest oh, I, no, I definitely could not i mean i literally i don't even know that I've, we like swimming on polls <laughs> polls <laughs> like swimming in polls Oh my god, do you say a hula, you know, like you you swirl it around your hula hoop? Hula hoop? Mm-hmm. So, my gym hula. teacher, I don't know why this just popped in my mind. My gym teacher from elementary school, she ta- called them hula hoops. Mm, jail. Go get your hula hoops. <laughs> jail. Jail. You're going to jail. <laughs> Go get your hula, hula hoop. Hoops. Okay. I like hula hooping. Love you guys. Love you. Bye. Uh, happy Thursday. Enjoy your Friday. Bye. Bye.